So welcome to week seven of the Alpha Course. Okay, how many have been here all seven weeks? Man, I'm proud of you. Don't miss next week. Linda, do not miss next week. So uh, now, uh, shh. So anyway, um, great to see you tonight. Hope to see you this weekend if possible. Now, if you could please help us out. If you believe you're going to make it on the weekend, which is Saturday morning and maybe Saturday afternoon, we would be so grateful if you'll help your table host by letting us know whether you are able to come in the morning or the afternoon or both. If, you're coming, if you can't come to either, that's fine. This is going to be recorded as well, so you'll be able to get it at lakeviewchristiancenter.com uh, or the, the Lakeview Christian Center YouTube page. So, um, so have you all already, huh? Good. So, um, so, so if you guys would please fill that out. And if you know someone that's not here tonight, if you could just maybe get in touch with them. So the breakfast is going to be amazing. Uh, if you've been, who's been to an Alpha Retreat breakfast before? Like 10,000 calories. I, I'm not kidding. And uh, then, then we'll have, if, if we continue on into the afternoon, if there's enough of us, we will have lunch. So... Um, all right. Well, thank you guys for being here again tonight. Um, so, so let me just, just tell you real quick. The, the, we'll have breakfast at 8.30. Shh, shh, shh. We'll have breakfast at 8.30. The session will start at 9. And then we'll do, if we're going to do the afternoon session, it's not going to, maybe 2 o'clock will be done by 2, 2.30 at the very latest. Um, the morning session ends at lunch. And then the afternoon session will actually begin at lunch. There's, there's some homework that your table host could give you tonight. Something from the, you guys have all heard the story of the prodigal son, or many of you have heard the story of the prodigal son. There's some questions. It's a part of the weekend. So you should be able, if you can get those questions at the end of the evening from your table host, that would be fantastic. So anyway, so the weekend's going to be great. I am so excited because I understand the founder of Alpha may be here. Isn't that great? Now, you may not know who he is, you may not have ever seen him before, but he's kind of hard to recognize, but, but this, this is the, Alf, uh, good, it's a groaner, isn't it? It's a groaner. So. so, anybody not know who that is? Come on, just give me, okay, so Nickelodeon is doing its job, all right. Okay, okay, rowdy crowd tonight, so if Alpha has done anything for us over the weeks that we've been here, I pray at least it has helped us to understand what clearly what biblical Christianity is and what biblical Christianity is not. There is a clear delineation between the grace of God extended to us in Jesus Christ that is given to us by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, and the religions of the world that say, believe in whatever that higher power is, and you hopefully will keep all the rules. And maybe, maybe, maybe you get to go to heaven. Okay? That just could not be any more clear cut. And so, uh, as I said, there's a big difference between religious meology and biblical Christianity. And basically, because meological Christianity is really not Christianity at all. All. It may include Jesus' name and other things and all that, but it's not biblical. It's not the gospel. Uh, it is not good news for me to think that I can be good enough, hope I can be good enough. That's not good news. Good news is that Jesus paid it all, all to him. I owe. That's good news. So if any of this is, is true, the good news is that Christ did for you and me what we could not do for ourselves. And that's what we've been hearing here for the last seven weeks. So tonight, our topic is, who is the Holy Spirit? Now, you know, when we talk about the Holy Spirit, I, I don't know, any of you guys get to see my little video this morning or this afternoon or sometime? Okay, all three of you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. You know, it's, you know, I go to the YouTube site and I see, okay, how many people watched it? It's like a negative five. It's like, how, how can there be a negative? Um, but... But growing up in my tradition, in, in, in my religious tradition, maybe your religious tradition, um, you know, there would be, you know, you would, you would make the sign of the cross. And the only thing I knew about the Holy Spirit was he had something to do with my shoulders, right? Because I pray in the name of the Father and the Son and the 
Holy Spirit. And so that was the extent of my knowledge of the Holy Spirit. I didn't know who he was or who he is. And so, <clears throat> so tonight we're going to talk about the fact that he is not a ghost. He's not a force. He's not an attitude or a thing. He is the third person of the Trinity. Like I said, he's not a force or a ghost or an attitude. Like, he's not like, like a spirit, like team spirit. Like, we've got spirit. Yes, we do. We've got spirit. How about you? Okay, let me just, let me just go ahead and close. Um, oh gosh, <laughs> that was great. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, nobody on live stream can see anything. I, I'm sure you heard what was going on, but it's pretty crazy. All right. Uh, so, uh, so, so he is, he's a person. He is the third person of the Trinity. And the Bible tells us that he thinks and he speaks and he leads and he, and he grieves. And, and we see this throughout the scripture that he's not an it. He's not a neuter. He is the third person of the Trinity. And, and, and Luke, uh, pardon me, in the, in the, in the uh, Acts of the Disciples, the Acts of the Apostles, uh, Luke, who wrote these, says, For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than these essentials. So we see the Holy Spirit is working in and with the new believers, directing and giving guidance and teaching. And then we see here as well, brethren, the scriptures had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke, foretold by the mouth of David concerning Judas, and there are, I could just pull out a bunch of scriptures here, but we can see here, and the scripture is very clear, that he is a person. We're going to talk about that a little bit more. But a, a little bit of Holy Spirit biblical history, we see that he was involved with creation. And just in the Genesis chapter 1, the very beginning, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty, darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the water. So we see the Spirit of God is involved with creation. We see that. We go to uh, Paul's letter to the Colossians, and we see that Jesus, in him, all things hold together and have their being. So you know, that would be telling us molecules. Everything that is, God holds together. God created. God has his way in his creation. And when we look back in the Hebrew scriptures, we, we, we see things on, if you want to turn to page 46 in your, in your manual, we will see that he came to particular people, came up at particular times to accomplish particular tasks. And you'll see names like Bezalel, the, the craftsmanship of the furnishings in the tabernacle, the, the ability to, to have the gifting to do those things. Gideon got, rose up in leadership against the Midianites, Israel's one of Israel's many enemies. And then Samson, we've heard the story of Samson. The spirit gave him strength against the Philistines. And then Isaiah, the prophet, we see just so many messianic prophecies that are given to us by Isaiah, who lived some 600 plus years before Jesus. And then we see here that he was, you'll see in your manual, he was promised by the father speaking through the prophets because of a new covenant, a new covenant that would be given. And so here's what the prophet Ezekiel writes. This is the 36th chapter, the 26th verse. I want you to, again, see the initiation of God in this. Again, be blown away, like I always want to be blown away, that God is initiating to us. He is coming to us, desiring to articulate the truth to us, which leaves us in a position as to whether I will passively or actively reject or actively accept. He says this, I 
will give you a new heart. This is the spirit of God. God says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will remove from your, you, your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Okay, so here come my cups again. You know it. Um, so he, why does he have to put a new, a new heart in us? Because we have a heart of stone. We've got a dead heart as it pertains to him. There's no life. There's no spiritual life in us. And so he comes to give us a new heart because we need a new heart. He comes to give us a new spirit because we need a new spirit. And he removes us from a stony life, a, li a heart of stone life, and he gives us a soft heart, a heart of flesh, and he puts his spirit in us by taking us out of Adam, placing us into Christ, and he moves on us to obey him. He puts a new want to in us. He changes our want to's. Is that perfect? But this is the work of God's spirit. And, and as I said, he's speaking to every one of us in this room. Everyone you're watching this evening, he is talking about the you here is you. So in case you're wondering who that is, that's you. That's every one of us in here. God who created all things says, you, I want to give you a new heart. I want to put a new spirit in you. I'll tell you what, if Oprah was here tonight and said, I want to give you a new car, you guys would be pretty excited about that, wouldn't you? Right? She's paying all the insurance and all the gas and all the mechanical stuff. You, we'd be all thrilled about that. But how long is that going to last this? I mean, in the dash, it may last 10 years, 12 years. What, the Spirit, what God is telling us that the Spirit of God does, he gives us in the dash and in the line brand new life. And then Joel, about 700 years before Christ, he says, it will come about after this that I will pour out my spirit on all mankind and your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams and your young men will see visions. And even on the male and female servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And so what Joel is prophesying of is what's called the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was poured out after the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus Christ. Christ, and they waited for the pouring out of the Spirit, and this actually, you find this scripture as well in Acts chapter 2, and we, and we see this to this day. I mean, I, I can tell you of the, the fulfillment of this prophecy, and I, I want to encourage you tonight too. Ask people at your table, how, how have you had this experience where you've had a dream that came true, or a vision that came true, something that happened with... Um, with Annette and me many, many years ago. Um, I'm trying to think of which one I want to tell you. Um, I'll tell you this one because Gina was there. Um, we were with a couple that had had multiple miscarriages. She, she got pregnant, she loses the baby. Pregnant, loses the baby. Pregnant, loses the baby. Pregnant. And so they just finally decided to adopt. And, uh, and so it looked like an adoption was going to come through. And so we were all gathered at Keith and Gina's house on Cena Drive. And... Uh, and we're celebrating the adoption. We're going to celebrate the adoption. Well, right before we all get there for dinner, the adoption falls through. And we're just heartbroken. But we got together anyway. We had dinner and we prayed together. And while we were praying, one of the people that was praying had a vision, just a clear vision of a baby in utero. And now you can imagine telling a woman who can't keep a pregnancy who just lost a baby that she wanted to have, that I just saw a baby in utero, and could we pray that you'd get pregnant and keep that baby? And she agreed. And about four weeks later, pregnant. And that baby girl named Courtney Grace is like 24 years old today. Now again, so... Again, I'm just saying, God does those. And, and there are multiple experiences of the Holy Spirit doing that. It's not like, it's like you're not even looking for it. You know, you're not like you're squinting real hard and hopefully you can get some, you know, some 
something in your eyes, you know, when you wake, you know, open up your eyes, that something looks like something. It just, boom, you're not even paying attention. It just happens. And this is what God does. And as time came forward for the birth of Jesus, there's like this, what, 400-year, what's called an intertestamental period between the last book of the Hebrew Scriptures, the book of Malachi, and the Gospel accounts. And so we begin to see a sudden increase in the work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we see this. John the Baptist, this word about John the Baptist, that he will be great in the sight of the Lord and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit while yet in his mother's womb. This is the angel speaking to the father, going to be the father, Zechariah, of John, that God was going to give him and Elizabeth a child and his name, and he would be named John. And then we see Mary here. Mary is visited by the angel. It says, the angel answered and said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High God will overshadow you. And for that reason, the holy offspring, sh offspring shall be called the Son of God. Not the Son of Joseph, though he would be recognized as such. The Son of God. Now, I don't remember if we talked about this or not, but you remember our in Adam diagram? Now, if Jesus is born of, of the sexual connection between Mary and Joseph, Jesus is not qualified to be the sinless son of God because he's born with a sinful DNA. Even if he lived a perfect life, he's still in Adam. His inheritance, his spiritual DNA is fallen. And so the spirit comes upon Mary so that Jesus is born into, if you will, God's lineage by the Holy Spirit. And then we see as John the Baptist's ministry increases, um, he links the Holy Spirit to Jesus. He says, John says this, he says, as for me, I baptize you with water, but one is coming who is mightier than I, and I'm not fit to untie his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Okay, first, let me just, just do a little... The word baptize, okay, I'm not going to give you the word in the Greek because I'm not sure I know what it is, but the word baptize simply means to submerge, okay, it's, it's not this little thing, it's submerge, it, and, and the picture that people understood of this baptize, you would take a dye, you take a cloth, rather, and you would submerge the cloth in the dye, and the dye would take on all the color characteristics, be saturated in that, uh, in the cloth. And so when, when what John is saying is he will baptize you, immerse you with the Holy Spirit and fire. Well, the Spirit, Jesus says, will lead us into the truth. The Holy Spirit is holy, okay? He's pure. And I think the word for fire here is like, we got spirit. Yes, we do. We got spirit. How about you? It's a passion. It's a passion. It's a real passion. It's God has come over me by the Holy Spirit. How can I not respond to a God that came hunting for me in spite of me to rescue me in the dash and forever the moment my heart stopped and I would be with him. And so Jesus taught what the Holy Spirit revealed. Jesus taught what the Holy Spirit revealed. So, and you and I have, through this Alpha, you've heard a lot of things with your physical ears. I mean, there were years I heard things with my physical ears, but I didn't understand with my inner man, my understanding, my spiritual understanding. But it's, the Bible says it's the job of the Holy Spirit to reveal to us, to make real to us that the Bible is the truth. And God chooses to do that when God chooses to do that, how God chooses to do that. Now, if I could just get a switch right here and just flip the switch, of course, but he's not doing that. He doesn't do that. He didn't do it with me. He doesn't do it with, he does what he does as he does. So, so here's what Jesus says. If you love, he said, I will ask the father, sorry. And he will give you another helper to be with you forever. Even the spirit of truth, whom the world, those in Adam, 
cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him for he dwells with you and will be in you. He will dwell with you and he will be in you. This is the spirit of truth. And so Jesus is saying he's asking the Father to give you another helper. Christ is the helper. The spirit is going to come, not confined by a physical body, but a spirit with no confining whatsoever, no limitations as to where he can be at any time. And then Jesus goes on to say here, when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will see this, guide you. He will direct you. He will lead you and do all the truth. Ask him. If, if he says the spirit is going to lead us in all the truth, why don't we just simply ask him? Hey, Lord, if this is true, would you lead me in all the truth? I want to know the truth. And I would argue that the only reason I want to know the truth is because the Holy Spirit is so messed with me that I want to know the truth. When seven weeks ago, maybe you couldn't have cared less. And so, when he comes, he'll guide you. He will guide you. You won't guide you. I won't guide you. He will guide you in all the truth. He'll bring glory to me by taking what is mine, Jesus says, the truth. And making it known to you know, there's a you, there's a big difference between reading something on a page and going eh, and reading up something on a page and going, oh my. I believe that. That's the truth. And that's what the spirit does. But again, he can be ignored. He can be resisted. He can be misunderstood. Um, but he wants to take control. Oh, what a, that's a hard word, isn't it? Control. I love giving up control. Don't you? Um, no. But he wants me to, to let go and trust him. And when I get in the wheelbarrow, what's that? I'm putting 100% of my being into the care of another person. So... So why ignore or resist? The question for me, I, I, this is really interesting. The question for me, I don't know if it's a question for you or not, but the question for me was not, do I not believe? Um, or am I afraid of the perceived ramifications of believing? Now, do you hear the difference? Was it, do I not believe or am I afraid of what I perceive of the ramifications of believing or do I simply want to not don't want to acknowledge my sin and that I have a need that's greater than I um, here's, here's the other thing when God is done um, pardon me when Alpha is done God will not be done um, he, he will be the gum on your shoe or, or, or he, he will be the gum on your soul if you will <laughs> how I make sure you're still awake. All right. So, so Jesus talked about the, <laughs> he talked about the Holy Spirit when he addressed the religious leader, Nicodemus, and told him in, the John, in John chapter three, maybe you guys have been through this scripture, but I just want to show this to you as, it, as Jesus describes the, the spirit. He says, flesh gives birth to flesh. Okay. We've talked about this. Loria gives birth to Loria. Okay. Wise Carver gives birth to Wise Carver. But the spirit gives birth to spirit. What he's saying here is, as you and I had nothing to do in our physical birth, we didn't have anything to do in our spiritual birth as well, except God opening our eyes to see and moving on us to be born again a second time. So flesh gives birth to flesh, physically alive, spiritually separated from God, but the spirit gives you life, eternal life, life in the dash and in the line. He said, you shouldn't be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. Now, here's the part of the spirit. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. 
so it is with everyone born of the Spirit. See, you don't see the wind. You see the effects of the wind, right? You see the effects of the wind. So one night in, I believe in March of 1976, the wind came blowing through this church in Baker, Louisiana. And that wind caught my heart and changed me, and gave me a heart of flesh, removed my separation, my being in Adam, and placed me into Christ. Did I fully understand that at the moment? I don't fully understand that to this day. But the more I get to know him, the more I get to know him. The more I know him, the more I trust him, the more I trust him, the more I love him, the more I love him, the more I desire to serve him. So he is speaking about his personal interaction with us. So it's important that you and I see this, that he is desiring to interact in each and every one of our lives. And you see his effects like the wind. I just mentioned to you a moment ago uh, a young lady named Courtney and her mom Don and Donna and husband Al. Um, I remember in Alpha, gosh, we were not, this church building was being built. It was after Katrina. I had a, uh, uh, a young man came to, uh, come to work with me. He was um, in the military. His, his battalion was the first to go from Kuwait into Iraq in um, Operation Desert Storm uh, being killed, had, a, had an IED go straight through his, <laughs> can you imagine, go straight through his Humvee and exit. Um, and so um, came back to uh, the United States, um, moved to New Orleans, his wife is from New Orleans. And uh, so I, I said, I, I mean, and, Every effing word out of my effing captain's mouth was F. It wasn't Frank. Um, and it's like, nah, we're going to hire this guy. And uh, so we hired him. And I started talking to him about it, invited him to Alpha, came to Alpha. Um, well, one Wednesday morning, he walked into my office right after Alpha. I think it was weeks. I don't remember what week, what week it was. But he sat down in, in, in front of my desk and he said, now, I want to get this straight. I recognize that I need a savior. I recognize that it's Jesus. I want to have my sins forgiven. And I pray and I ask him to forgive me and come into my life. I said, yeah, that's pretty good. I didn't say another word. This captain in the United States Army put his elbows on his knees, put his head in his hand, and prayed and gave his life to Jesus Christ. Now, it's interesting when I'd come into the office in the morning, instead of him looking at the news or whatever, I would see my captain reading his Bible. One other thing, virtually every night, my friend had, because he had PTSD, would wake up having horrific nightmares. And the day he gave his life to Christ, he never had another nightmare. Now, can I explain that? No. Does God do that for some and not for others? Yes. Do you know why? No idea. But it doesn't nullify what he does do when he does do that. And there are so many other examples that if I had time, I would just give you one after another. Um, but sometimes you see nothing, you know? Maybe you guys have prayed and say, man, I don't feel anything. I've prayed that prayer. I haven't felt anything. That, what do feelings have to do with anything, right? I mean, there's lots of times I don't feel like doing a lot of things. I don't, maybe, maybe I don't feel like going somewhere, but I have to go there. So, and, and, and I think this is maybe something, too, that, that we challenge with, we're challenged with just in terms of getting in the wheelbarrow or saying I do or receiving the gift, is that I want to feel something. And that's great. I think it's great to want to feel something. But we receive Christ by faith. I recognize I have a need. 
I recognize the cross of Jesus Christ is sufficient. I recognize the resurrection of Jesus Christ for the dead to pay for my sins and to give me new life. I believe that, but I don't feel that. Now, what if you go to a doctor's appointment and the doctor says, how you, he asks you, how are you feeling, Frank? I said, feeling great, doc, feeling great. Well, we just did some blood work on you, and you may be feeling great, but you ain't great. And we need to do immediate surgery. We've seen something here, and we need to do surgery. But, Doc, I feel fine. Well, Frank, uh, I just want to show you this. You, you need to have surgery immediately. Now, if I don't feel like I need to have surgery, it's my word against the doctor's word. And if this doctor's got fellowships and all kinds of references and everything else, I'm going to say, okay, I'm either going to have to go by my feelings or I'm going to have to trust a doctor that's seen my situation and has dealt with my situation and can heal me from my situation. See, it's not the feelings have nothing to do with it. The issue is, do I believe that I have a need that a doctor tells me he can heal me of? The heck with feelings. So I, I know this is a challenge. We want to feel something. And again, pray that you feel something. Um, but is it the truth? And if this is the truth, and God has made this offer to each and every one of us, the question then is, why am I resisting? What more do I, what more evidence do I want? What more am I looking for? You know, we've all heard the, the story of the guy that, the uh, house is flooded, right? He's on his roof. Oh, God. Right? You, I don't even have to tell you the whole story, right? Oh, God, deliver me. And he sends a boat. And the guy says, no, 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 God's going to deliver me. And the boat goes away. And then here comes a helicopter. Sir, just grab the ladder. No, God's going to deliver me. And God did deliver him. But he refused to be delivered. Because it didn't happen just like he thought it should. He was going to determine how it happened. But God determines how it happens. He works in each and every one of us his way. The issue is not how I feel. The issue is, is this the truth? So anyway, so, um, so sometimes we don't feel much, but suddenly there's whoosh. I have a very, very dear friend, lifelong friend. He, went, he and I went to high school together, um, and we became good buddies um, still to this day. I, I think he likes me, but I'm not sure. Um, <laughs> Actually, I, I think he kind of endures me because he doesn't want to be like me. That's the problem. Um, so uh, he comes to Alpha, and I, and I kind of laid out, you know, as we do at our tables, as you do at your tables, you know, God has offered us eternal life, forgiveness. We cannot earn it. He wants to enter into a relationship with us that will give us abundant life while we're here. Not, not stress-free, not trouble-free life, but he will be with us in the midst of our tribulations, and then the day our heart stops, we will be with him forever. Why would you turn down that offer? So I'm looking at him square in the face. Very, very successful guy. And he, I don't even know if he knew this was coming out of his mouth, but there was one word that came out of his mouth, one three-letter word. And he said, just popped right out of his mouth, ego. And I thought, you nailed it. You nailed it. I don't want to admit that I have a need that I can't fulfill myself. I don't want to. I may not be perfect. I may not know everything. I may not be able to do everything. But in surrendering to Christ, I admit I need him in a way in which nothing else can satisfy me. In a way in which I cannot accomplish what only he can accomplish for me. And the issue is ego. So, but I would argue, you know, there's ample evidence here that has been work, that God has been working by the Holy Spirit in our lives. And let me just rush through here. Some evidence is the Holy Spirit's working in our lives. Just think about these things, please. Just think, and maybe even a, just check this off in your mind. One, 
uh, you have heart palpitations every time you see a wheelbarrow. Um, okay, that's the only one that has some humor attached to it. Okay. Two, you're still coming. Really? You thought it was going to be, you were going to be one and done, didn't you? But you're still coming. Or if you're watching live stream, you're still watching. Three. Uh, you're curious or convinced or committed where before you couldn't have cared caca about this Christian crud. <laughs> Nothing. Um, you're critically thinking. You're not just assuming. You're not just, well, that's what my grandparents believe. That's what my parents believe. You're actually thinking about these things. And I'm so excited about that. I hope you are as well. Number five, uh, you're reading and you're even understanding what you're reading in the Bible. These are evidences the Spirit's working. Number six, you're praying as if you were conversing with God because you are. You really are. And he's happy to listen. You're talking about God in public, but not as an expletive. You're, you're actually acknowledging the presence of God. Uh, you're attending church more regularly. You're even liking it. You're listening you're, this is weird. This is really weird. Um, that's happening. Uh, nine, you're more conscious of sin. See, this is what the Holy Spirit does. He doesn't make you less conscious. doesn't make me less conscious of screwing up, doing things my way. He makes me more aware of that. But without condemnation. Just reminds me of the cross. Number 10, experiencing a change in actions and attitudes. You just feel different. You do different. You speak different. These things are happening. Number 11, I, there's a, a sense, there's a sense of his absence. Now, this is interesting. Uh, Tim Keller, just a great Presbyterian minister, now, now retired, but still speaking. Uh, Tim Keller said this, a sense of his, pardon me, a sense of his absence is a sign of his presence. Now, think about that. You're thinking about things you haven't thought about, maybe forever and forever. Now there's kind of this sense of I'm not fully dressed. There's some sense that something's not right. It's a sense that you didn't have before of his absence. Like there's something that I'm missing. And Keller says a sense of his absence is actually a sign of his absence presence a sign of his presence and then 12 you're attending the alpha weekend really well i hope you are i truly hope you are and i hope you'll sign up tonight if if you can even come just for breakfast just get breakfast come for breakfast and uh that that will be wonderful to have you here as well and then 13 eight weeks just doesn't seem long enough now remember it used to be 10 weeks but eight weeks doesn't seem long enough. So I want to let you know tonight, um, not immediately following Alpha, the Tuesday following Alpha, but the, the week following that, May 2nd, we are actually having a six-week study uh, in the Bible that will begin. It'll have dinner just like this. It's going to look pretty much just like this. And so we would love you uh, to sign up for that. We'll put out some registration for that as well, or you can register online. But we would love for you, if again, if, if you've gained a lot through this six weeks, pardon me, these seven weeks, soon to be eight weeks, please um, continue to learn, because faith comes by hearing the word of Christ. So, so, um, you know, we've, we've, we've talked about some things in terms of, you know, here's a, it's how did you even get here? Did you think about how did you even get here? Now, I know you got here by your car. I know that, but who invited you? What are the things that had to happen? The relationships you had to have, the people you had to meet, the places you had to be to be in this room tonight. You think about that? It, it's an interesting thought as you would wind your way into the past or back into the past to see, how did I get here? Who lassoed me into this thing anyway? So, uh, and so we, we discussed that all of God is relational. And he typically uses relationships to draw us into relationship with himself. He weaves our lives together and then, boom, here, here we are. I want to just real quickly just show you uh, 
This is, this is in the New Orleans Academy first grade class of 1963. Okay, how many were born or alive in 1963? Okay, you, yeah. okay, yeah. All right, not many of you. Okay, this, this is where I went from, from first grade to uh, through high school, I went to New Orleans Academy. Anybody know who I am? Here, here, here's the original Hannibal Lecter right there. Um, right there? That cute little Italian boy. That is, that's, I mean, look at the cheeks on that kid. Um, anyway, one of my best friends was, was this guy, Brian. I love Brian. Um, and we did everything together. His, I remember his phone number. I remember his address. I remember his date of birth. I remember all these things about Brian. And Brian's a, a Jewish friend. And I actually kind of did everything with him, including I didn't do his bar mitzvah with him, but I went to his bar mitzvah and, and all that. We were just good buddies. Um, Brian left NOA in um, eighth grade uh, because uh, he just couldn't cut it anymore, the grades. Very difficult place to be, so he had to go to Ben Franklin. Um, <laughs> so, so um, but I stayed in touch with Brian. Called him. Brian goes to LSU. I'd see him at LSU. He gets his PhD in industrial psychology, you know, and uh, moves off to Atlanta, and we, and I just stay in touch. Every August 4th, I'm calling, Brian, happy birthday. He's not answering the phone. <laughs> Brian. Um, well, one day he was in New Orleans, and he and I had lunch together, and we were just talking about um, how our lives had gone, and uh, Brian was kind of in a, you know, kind of a rough patch, and I began to tell him my story of how Jesus had just gotten a hold of my life. And my Jewish industrial psychologist is sitting there. And we talked for a while, and I could just see that Brian was really connecting, was open. And I said, Brian, what if, what if, back in 1963, God knew that he would weave your life and weave my life and not let me forget your birthday and stay in touch with you. And we'd run into one another at LSU so that one day you and I could sit and talk about the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who loved you so much that he gave the Lamb of God, the Passover Lamb of God, to take away your sins. And as I looked at my Jewish industrial psychologist lifelong friend, I watched tears just coming down his eyes, and he just said just two words, what? If. Now, I'm not quite sure where Brian is in his faith, but I love that man. And, uh, and I just, again, just to me, again, a, an example of how you end up in places you have no idea how you got there. But I would argue that it is the work of God's Holy Spirit weaving intentionally relationships and interests and career moves and all those things that bring us to where we are. And that story is true uh, as well of a, a dear, dear friend of, of mine who I have asked to come and share his story tonight. Uh, I have known Donnie and Judy since, I guess, the year, phew, gosh, 1999 maybe or something like that. And um, I, I asked Donnie, and this is very difficult for Donnie to do, and so I greatly appreciate his heart to share. But uh, Donnie's going to come share with us his story about how the Holy Spirit worked in his heart and Judy's heart to even bring him to be sitting at that table tonight. So, Donnie, would you please come, bud? <laughs> Hello, hello. Good evening. Good evening, everybody. Thank you, Frank. Thank you again, Frank. <clears throat> and good evening to everyone out there in TV land. <laughs> um, <clears throat> what a blessing and a privilege to, uh, to be here and uh, to give my story, my testimony 
of uh, what, what God has done in our life. I'm sorry my wife's not here with me. Um, I'm going to start with a little nostalgia. A lot of you probably won't know, but uh, I'm going to go back 52 years. 52 years. Uh, if anybody remembers where Frank skating ring was on West Napoleon off of Transcontinental, which is now Earl's Plumbing. Okay, well, I was a skate boy there 52 years ago, and Judy came and dropped her sister off on Friday night, and she came back and picked her up, and evidently she must have seen me, because <laughs> she came back the next week <laughs> without her sister. <laughs> Oh, and here we are, 48 years married now. <laughs> um, I was a freshman in high school. She was already out of school working at the Hilton. And I was like, what, what, you, what is going on here? But anyway, I uh, went to work and started working. She was out of school working and uh, graduated in May and got married in January. So... Uh, I'll fast forward this to 23 years ago. We had a conversation. We were blessed to have four beautiful children. I'm self-employed, got a nice home, and got a camp, got a fishing camp, hunting camp, got a boat, you know, just living the American dream, right? Uh, we said, you know, we got everything, but there's something missing. There's something missing here. There's got to be something more to life than this. And so a year later, I left two days after Christmas and went up to Woodville, Mississippi, hunting, where a buddy of mine worked for Entergy. And it was pouring down rain. There was about 10 people in camp. And we got up the next morning, pouring down still. I said, look, I'm going to go sit in the stand. I said, okay, uh, I'll drop you off. Just me and him went. Uh, he dropped me off. I got up into the stand. And went in there five minutes. And then I hear my name being called in the dark rain. Donnie. Donnie. I said, oh, this doesn't sound good. So I got out the stand, went, met him on the road. Now, he had a cell phone 23 years ago. In Woodville, Mississippi, in the woods, okay, and it worked. My wife was on the phone. She said, Brennan's in the hospital. He's in a coma. Now, Brennan was my youngest. We had four children. We had three boys and a girl. Brennan was my youngest son. He was a, he was a senior at Ridgewood. He wanted to play baseball for Steve Strapola, so that's where he went. So I dropped to my knees and I said, Lord, please don't let anything happen to him. And Clyde says, come on, let's go. I'm going to take you in. So he drove me, he drove me in. Well, Brennan was out the night before with his girlfriend. It was her girlfriend's birthday. And they were at a place off of Carrollton. And they were all in there drinking, having a good time. Well, Brennan loved Gatorade. Well, this boy had, the Gator, had a Gatorade bottle and he had it with the GHB drug in it, the Daperate drug. Not knowing what was in it, he picked it up and he drank half the bottle. So he fell out. And his girlfriend asked the bartender to call an ambulance and he said, get him out of here, he's drunk. So she proceeded to go get one of his friends, put him in his truck. He says, I can't take him. Went back in, got another friend. Well, the boy that knew what he took says, look, I have, to, I have to bring him. I have to bring him to the hospital. And then he says, got him in his car, and he said, no, I can't take him. I got all this other paraphernalia in my car. So she had to go back in and get another friend. And the time they got him, in the, got him in his truck, brought him to charity, he had already stopped breathing. They said 12 minutes. So by the time I got to charity from Woodville, Mississippi, I got there and I ran through the hospital looking for my son, looking for my wife. <laughs> I 
And I found him. He was, he was laying. He's 18 years old, healthy as a horse. He's laying in the bed just like he's sleeping. Well, we were in that hospital for 11 days. The second day, a gentleman, the son went to Ridgewood, and he used to pray before the boys went out on the field. He came up there, and he asked if he could go and pray over him. I said, sure. There's so many people up there, about, about as many as in this room. I don't know how they got up there. But, you know, some things that go on in our lives that we don't never forget. And I'll never forget this. You know, he, he went in and he prayed and he came back out. And I remember him sitting in the corner. You know, I had been for a couple of hours. And he got up and he walked to me. And he, he handed me this track. And he said, if you get an opportunity, I'd like for you to read it. And I took it. And I stuck it in my pocket. just like this. And that night I took it out. And I read it. And I read it again. And I read it again. And I did do what it told me to do, not knowing what I was doing. I don't have time to tell you what else went on in this hospital other than the fact that I did everything, or we did everything, medically speaking, possible to get him back. We brought him, we transported him to St. Charles General. We put him in hyperbaric chambers. It was an ordeal to get him there. He had to, the doctors and nurses, everyone had to, had to travel with him. There's one thing I, I share sometimes, sometimes I don't share. I feel like the Lord's telling me to share this with y'all tonight. That when he was in that hyperbaric chamber, there's a, there's a microphone, you can talk to him. And the nurse said, go ahead, you can talk to him. And I told him, I said, I love you. I love you, Brendan. I said, Lord, don't take him. Take me. He's only 18. And there was tears that came down his eyes. Several days later, we were approached by Lopa. I didn't know who Lopa was. It was about the eighth day. So we went and met in their office, sat in front of the desk, and the lady asked me and my wife, will we donate his organs? Because everything we had done, medically speaking, he was just going to be, he was just going to be a vegetable. And we both looked at each other without hesitation, and we said we would. Now I'll tell you, we had this conversation too before. No one would hurt my children because I would, I would take care of them. And so now I look back and see what the Spirit of God had done in me for us to donate Brennan's organs and for eight people's lives to be saved. So we have his funeral and two weeks later, I get a revelation. I don't know what a revelation is, but I got it. And it was to pick up his word and read it. I opened that Bible up, and the first scripture I read was in John 14, 27. Jesus says, peace I leave you with, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give. He says, do not let your hearts be troubled, nor let it be fearful. That peace, ladies and gentlemen, right here, I've never lost it. I've never lost that peace. And these tears are tears of joy now. Because of my Lord and Savior's grace and mercy. Second scripture he gave me was Ephesians 2, 8, 9. He said, for by grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourself. It is a gift from God, not as a result of works. One may not boast. Another one that went right here. I never lost it. I know it was only because of his grace in my life. And the greatest invitation anyone could ever receive was in Matthew eleven twenty eight, twenty nine, 29, and 30. 
Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon ye and learn from me, for the gentle and humble of my heart will give rest to your soul. I never, ever felt this way in my life, and still to this day. And one more I'll give you in Jeremiah 29, 11, he says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for a Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans for a hope and a future. And this has been my future now for 22 years. Being able to, I'm in the exterminating business. I get to see many, many people each and every day. And I never knew that my business would be my mission field. That I could share the gospel with so many people each and every day. And to be here and to share it with you all tonight. This is an honor and a privilege and a blessing. And I thank y'all. I thank you, Frank. And I thank the church. Y'all have a blessed night. <laughs> thank you, Jesus. And thank you, Brennan. <laughs> oh, one thing. What me and my wife had spoke about. What we didn't have. What we were looking for. It was Jesus. He's the one the one we're looking for that filled that void. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So the Holy Spirit does a lot. He does it all. He is really he is God's real estate agent. That's what he is. He shows us our real estate before God. It's, it's, that's what he, he does. It's, it's his job to show us um, whether we're in the dominion of darkness or in the kingdom of light. That's, that's, that's what he does. He convicts us of this and reveals uh, this to us so that we would respond. So, um, so who is he? Well, he's the third person of the, Holy, of the Trinity. He comes to reveal just like he did to Donnie and Judy in the most painful of ways. But, you know, one thing I've heard J Judy say on more than one occasion is that she would not take Brennan back. Is this right, Donnie? She would not take Brennan back if it meant she had to forfeit Jesus. Now, for a mother to be able to say that, that has to be God's spirit. It has to be. And so... So here's, so here's what he does. He comes to reveal Christ to us and all that Christ means to us. That, that he loves us. He has a plan for our lives. That we each fall short of God's perfect standard. That he's provided the way through Jesus. Not our efforts. As well intended as they may be. And he then compels us to accept Jesus as the only means of experiencing real life now and forever. And then he empowers us, having gotten in the wheelbarrow, said, I do receive the gift. He empowers us to live above our circumstances and love others as we have been loved. So, again, 2,000 years ago, Jesus hung, hung from a cross. And right before he died, again, I'm giving some poetic license here, you know that. He said to you and to me, I do. And as I've said, that, that, that I do echoes through the canyons of history right into each and every one of our hearts again tonight. Because if I don't say I do, I haven't. But God, being rich in mercy, has come to us that we would say, I do. Okay. Well, um, sure hope you guys can, can make it to the retreat. It's just Saturday morning or Saturday afternoon. We would love to have you, but we are meeting here next week for commencement, for graduation, and uh, for uh, a really important, a real important session. Uh, what is the church? What does the Bible say the church of Jesus Christ is? 
talk about, talk about break a stereotype to smithereens, what I thought the Bible's definition of the church was. And so please, if you can, join us next week. Join us this weekend if you can. We are so, again, so appreciative to you guys continuing to be with us. Let's take a quick break, and uh, we will get back to our tables. So thank you. Donnie, thank you again.